Let's get started. It's a pleasure today uh, to uh, welcome Professor Zico Coulter, who's at Carnegie Mellon University and also is the um, a newly appointed chief scientist of the newly appointed Pittsburgh office mm -hmm. of the Bosch Center for AI, BCAI. Um, Zico has research interests and a, a track record of research, which is at the um, intersection of machine learning, optimization, and control. And as such, he's been very interested in his research in investigating um, properties of um, robustness and um, explainability um, and a, you know, an understanding and how it might be used of, um, of learning methods, machine learning methods. Um, and I, he's going to talk on that topic today. Um, Zico is a friend and welcome to <laughs> Berkeley, Zico. Um, he was a graduate student at Stanford and then, um, and then went to MIT um, to do his uh, postdoc before joining Carnegie Mellon. Welcome. Oh, and he's won some awards too. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, some, you know, really great uh, best paper awards at these different um, AI conferences like KDD and, and IJKAI. Um, so welcome, Zico, and thank you for coming. Thanks very much, Claire. All right, so um, I'm talking today about provable adversarial robustness in deep learning. Um, before I get into that, though, and, and I should say thank everyone for coming. I know there's there's two AI seminars you could go to right now, and thank you for coming to this one, those that showed up. It's a sign of the times that there's going to be two of these things ongoing at any given time, but that's really a great thing for AI when it comes down to it. So um, I'm going to talk today about adversarial robustness. But before I start, I just want to spend one slide on highlighting um, some of the other work going on in our labs. This is not the only thing that we're working on. Um, we also do some work in integrating optimization procedures into machine learning, uh, into deep models in particular, where you have an actual solver as a layer in a deep network. We have a lot of work, or some, well, one student has a lot of work on uh, understanding the nature of temporal models, so understanding the differences between like recurrent and convolutional models, um, some work in input convex neural networks, those are neural networks that are convex in their inputs, um, some work in learning uh, uh, two-player zero-sum games, some work in understanding the, the dynamics of things like GAN optimization, as well as a whole other line of work actually on applications of a lot of these things to a lot of domains, but mainly uh, chiefly uh, applications in energy systems. But what I want to talk about today is some of our work uh, in provable robustness in deep models. So this is the topic of today, and this is going to be actually just sort of a single topic talk. So I'm not going to give a broad overview of our research. I'm going to talk about one topic, which basically spans two different papers. Um, one was at ICML one, uh, this past year. One's coming up at NIPS this year. Um, and I'm going to sort of try to walk through what our methodology is here and how this leads to robustness and what we can say about robustness of deep models. Uh, feel free to interrupt at any time. You can ask questions during it. Uh, it's going to be as interactive as people want. I'll try to get through all the slides regardless. So let's talk about adversarial robustness. So I assume most people here have seen this picture before. Actually, has anyone not seen this picture before? By a show of hands? OK, good. So this is now, I think, a well-known feature of deep models. People I know in this room have actually worked on the same topic. So um, you take an image. So deep models uh, work amazingly well in tasks like vision, right? They've solved vision to human level performance, right? Um, but you take an image like this. You add a tiny uh, amount of random noise to that image to get something like this, and all of a sudden, the uh, famous panda is now classified as a gibbon uh, with really high confidence, right? And this is not just specific to this. I'll, I'll mention a few other examples in a second. But basically, what this means is that these models are fundamentally in a, a kind of brittle in a way. They can easily be fooled. And the way we fool them is actually not that very hard. Um, it's just an optimization problem. So we basically what we're doing to find this perturbation, it's not a random perturbation. The way we find it is we think about um, all perturbations within some set. So this is perturbation delta within some set delta. This is big delta. This is usually like a norm bounded perturbation set. Um, and we basically try to maximize our loss when we apply our model uh, on the input plus that <coughs> perturbation. And we just maximize this loss instead of normally, you know, you minimize this, this same sort of loss when you solve, when you train your classifier. Here we're going to find a perturbation that maximizes our loss here. And really here, as I said before, 
this is some perturbation set like a norm ball. This is the model's prediction on the input plus the perturbation. And we just optimize it with some procedure like just projected gradient descent. Uh, and in doing so, if you take really any deep model that's trained on just in a normal fashion and, and apply this procedure, you will be able to fool your model. Now the next question is sort of, does this really matter? Does it matter that we can do this? Um, and I would say yes, though of course I should admit here I'm, I'm biased in this, I work in this topic. So why does this matter? Um, because in some sense this is kind of like a measure zero set, right? We're, we're, we're finding this perturbation to specifically fool the model. So why should we really care that we can do this? And I think there's a few reasons that you might want to care about this, even though we don't really expect when we deploy our systems in the world to face an adversary that can, you know, uh, adversarially manipulate each image the system sees in a way that's worse for that given image, right? We don't, we don't expect that, you know, to be able to manipulate images at a pixel level. Um, but despite that, I would say this thing still matters. The reason for that is sort of, is sort of, I think there's a few reasons for this. The first is that even though this is talking about kind of worst case adversarial perturbations, um, it's actually been shown by a bunch of recent papers that these are not uh, don't have to be quite as bad as you would think. So you can actually do things like rotate or scale images or translate images to also fool classifiers. This is a revolver. This is by um, Alex Madri's group. It's a revolver that you then rotate a little bit and it looks like a mouse trap now. This is some work um, by Ayer Weiss and his students showing that if you just sort of take this image and translate it a bunch, the lost landscape is actually really weird. It's not at all like this is a consistent thing. It's sort of changing label all the time as you move this image around. Um, the other, so, so, so this is not a matter of just sort of worst case inputs. This is sort of revealing something fundamental, I would say, about deep models in the first place. They are kind of brittle in some sense that we don't really understand yet. The second one is that robustness does, if you train a model to be robust, it does typically result in more interpretable um, features and gradients, things like this. So, so if I take an image and perturb it to look like some other image, if the model is robust, it has to actually look like that other image. It can't think that's a given. You have to actually make it look like a given to, to do that. Um, and the last one, I think, is actually the one that I would kind of highlight most of all, which is to say that people make claims about human level performance from these systems. And I think kind of innate in that, when we say something is a human level, you know, which is human level of performance and image classification, it is natural to think that this means these systems will also, in some sense, be resilient in the same way as humans are. Right? Not, maybe not the people in this room, but people that aren't as, you know, well versed in machine learning as people in this room very often think that. And these examples, I think, do cast a light on just how different these models are than actual human, you know, the human visual system. And so if nothing else, these are very instructive at understanding just how deep models differ from, you know, what we think of as human level classification. Uh, there's a question there. The yes. What is the notion of more I actually won't dwell on that. So this is also, this is um, uh, actually, were you an author on this paper? No, you're, you're not one of the authors on the paper. So, so it's also out of Alex Meyer's group. I would just refer you to that. Basically, it means that if you look at an image gradient, um, saying training, changing a, a panda to a given, if you do it with a robust model, it will change the image in ways that actually make it look like a given, not some random. So, so this, if you have a robust model, this image here will actually subtract off the panda parts and add the given parts to it. Um, and so in some sense, the gradients, like the, the, the thing you're trying to optimize here, becomes more like what you think the gradient should be. Would be the sort of, you know, the quick pass on this. All right. So with that as a motivation, I want to go over now one way in which we've actually been able to create classifiers that are provably robust to this phenomenon. The time it was one of the few ways of doing it. Of course, it's been a lot of work's been building on it since then. Um, but I want to go over it in some detail and talk about how we can build classifiers that are not susceptible to this to this fault. Um, and I'm going to do it in the following way. So first, I'm going to talk about kind of generally adversarial robustness in deep models. I'm then going to talk about our method for achieving this 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 adversarial robustness, which is based on convex outer approximations uh, of what I'm calling the adversarial polytope. So I'll define all those things in a second. Um, these do work, and they give a nice framework, but they don't scale very well. 
So I'll talk very briefly about some more recent work we have on making these things scale to at least slightly bigger models. We're still very far from ImageNet level, but I think at least slightly bigger models here. And finally, I'll end with some experimental results. Um, one thing I should add, especially to, to, to this audience here that has you know, both an ML but also some control, control background, is that although I'm talking about classification here, fundamentally what we're talking about are ways to provide guarantees about the, 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 the quantities output by deep networks. These things are typically hard to say anything about because they're big, deep, nonlinear functions. Um, but these methods let you provide guarantees about essentially the, the, the reachable space of a deep network. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. So let's first start by talking about just sort of general adversarial robustness in, in, in deep models. All right, so the question here is how do we present, how do we, sorry, how do we prevent these adversarial attacks in deep learning? Because there's been a lot of work, since this was, this, this was sort of not discovered, because it's been known for a very long time, but since it was kind of brought to the forefront by some work um, by, by Ian Goodsell and others, a few years ago, um, this has really been a, a very common trend in machine learning has been to try to pr provide ways to, to build models that are not susceptible to these attacks. And the first way this typically works is that, I will call this sort of strategy number one, is that we somehow want to modify the model, either during training or after training, uh, in a manner that seems to prevent these existing attacks, right? We take an existing attack, and all of a sudden, we change our model a little way, and it seems to prevent this from actually happening. Um, so this is a perfectly reasonable strategy. You might try this. And the history, though, this goes something like the following. So uh, there'll be a paper published that says you can prevent these attacks by, say, distillation. And then someone else will come out and say, no, actually, this doesn't prevent uh, these attacks. Someone else will say, well, you don't need to worry about these things if you are given translation and rotation. And then another people will come out and say, oh, well, actually, you do have to, have to worry about them. Uh, most famously, um, at iClear last year, not this year, um, there were nine, actually, there were 12 defenses published, but nine of them uh, sort of were, were, were notable in the sense. People presented nine new defenses you can use to protect your model. And these were actually broken before the review period finished for iClear. iClear's open review. So, um, Anish and some others out of MIT, uh, and, and some folk, uh, collaborators at, at, at here, actually, Nicholas and, uh, and, uh, and, and David Wagner, um, they, they were able to, to break these before the review period was actually over. So, you know, seems like you might want to have something a little bit more fundamental and, and sound than this. So I'm happy to say that we actually have a model now that I, I know this won't happen to, right? I know no one's going to break our thing because we actually have a proof that it, it, it's not broken. It can't be broken, again, under these very particular types of attacks, of course, but, but we finally have something we can say that's more than this. So the second strategy that I would emphasize, that you know, we, we want to go beyond that, right? We want to go beyond just doing something that seems like adding noise or something like this that seems to prevent these things from happening. Um, so the second strategy that I would emphasize, which is sort of lays the groundwork for the approach that we're going to follow here, is um, the technique of robust optimization. So fundamentally, the training of a deep network that is robust to these attacks is a robust optimization problem. It's not a new class of problem. It's been studied uh, since, the, since the 70s. Um, but the idea is, instead of minimizing our normal loss, we actually want to minimize, which would just be you know, minimizing our, our network to minimize loss of x, y pairs drawn from our distribution. We want to add this maximization over the perturbation into our training procedure. Right? So we want to train models such that we get low loss not only on the examples themselves, but low loss on the worst case perturbation around those models. Right? And that's going to be our, our goal here for, for deep networks. Now, of course, this formalism, I would say, goes back a very, very long time, um, back to the, at least the 70s. Um, there's a good book on robust optimization um, by Bental and others. Uh, there's a good review from 2011. Um, but the thing I actually want to add here is that for a linear model, so say we didn't have a deep network, we just had a linear model, this problem actually I would say is pretty much solved. So for a linear model, this is a, sort of a well-known thing, but not that well-known, I guess. Um, the idea is we have, some, we have some examples here, say this region, th th those regions, and we want to minimize the loss of the worst case example in these things. This can actually be solved by, an, an, uh, I guess, for depending on your what kind of norm it is, that can be solved for L infinity problems as a, as a linear program. 
So the idea is pretty simple, actually. Um, if I want to uh, maximize my, over my perturbation space, less than some, with, with norm less than some epsilon, of my loss applied basically for a linear model here. So I'm taking my parameters, I'm taking the inner product of my parameters and the example plus some delta there. Because these losses are monotonic decreasing for any classification loss, I can move the maximization inside the loss, it becomes a minimization there. So I can apply a minimization just to this term here inside. And what that boils down to, that can be now solved analytically. Um, and so what you get is that this worst case loss is actually equivalent to subtracting off epsilon times the dual norm of theta inside the loss function. All right, so that's actually all it is. When you have a linear model, you can compute exactly this inner optimization problem here, and it just involves basically a dual norm of whatever your original perturbation bound is. Okay. And um, importantly, this is inside the loss function here, not outside as normal regularization is. This is a norm of the parameter vector inside your loss. So if I have a big margin, basically, it means I can, you know, this can be big. But if I have a very small margin, this can penalize me a lot. Okay, so that, that's the I'm idea sorry. of this. Yeah. Sorry, I can't sit through these talks without yelling about this. Like, we teach this in the first. Like, of course. We well, this is what that's, that's why that's this is a support vector machine. Of course. This, but well, well, okay. Ben, let me let me actually say this. So yeah, okay. this goes by this weird name of robust support vector machine because the loss is inside. The, the, the regularization is inside the loss here. That's not the normal SVM. It is different. It's it's, it's, it's qualitatively it's different. You see that it is several. <laughs> okay, like the That's, but this is why this is on my first slide, not my later slides. Uh, okay, that's fine. Okay, it's also from the 70s, right? So I'm saying this is a solved problem. It's good to start with some interactive material, right? Before something. So I agree with you. Okay, I agree with you. This is easy. Well, yeah, but I mean, it's, so it is robust optimization, right? From from back in the day. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So the actual question is: Now I have this. Now I have a deep network. What do I do now? Right, so the difference now is that when you take a norm ball and put it through a multi-layer deep network, the image of that norm ball is no longer a nice convex shape. All right, so it's going to be some nasty nonlinear shape that you can't easily optimize over. And so the question, and, and this is what we call the adversarial polytope. It's, it is a polytope. It's, it's a connected region, but it's not going to be a convex one. And so the question is, how do I find the worst case example now in this set here? How do I find the worst case sort of bound in this region? Um, and now, all of a sudden, uh, solving this inner optimization problem of just finding a worst case perturbation, which is over this non-convex set, is no longer easy anymore. I now can't actually do this, and so I have to do something else. And so this is what I'm, gonna, this is what I'm going to, uh, to talk about today. And so if you want to do this, there are basically three strategies, I would argue, that, that you can actually achieve this with. So the first, well, so I'll go through each of these. So we have this sort of true reachable region in our last layer, of course. And, and I should clarify, sort of, um, the, the, the class boundary in this last layer is going to, be, going to be, of course, linear, right? So we want to minimize some linear function over this last layer here. And there are three ways you can do it. The first is you can find, try to find some, to, to optimize over some inner approximation to this polytope. And that is really equivalent to just finding an adversarial example, right? So any adversarial example is, of course, going to be inside this polytope here. Uh, but we can't enumerate the entire thing, so we can't solve it exactly, at least with, with, with normal methods or with, with efficient methods. And so we could just try to find some example, you know, and, and then compute the gradient. And actually, if you can find an adversarial example that actually is a valid subgradient of this overall function, if you can solve this problem exactly, it's an, it's an actual subgradient. So we just try to find a good one. And this is sort of goes by the name of adversarial training. And I should argue, I should point out, this actually is, as far as we know right now, the best practical method we have to do this. So this is, was, was, was sort of the original adversarial training. Uh, Ludwig and others worked on this in a more, I don't want to say robust, a, a, much, <laughs> a much better way of doing it, uh, just with PGD, but with some random restarts too, um, in, in some later work. And this actually is practically the best way we know how to make these things robust and we, that we still can't break. Yeah. What, what is the inner approximation? Yeah, so the inner approximation is basically something we can reach, some reachable set. In this case, it's kind of implicitly defined by what we can reach via gradient descent. 
starting at some initial point, maybe with randomization. So it's hard to define exactly what this, what this, inner, poly, what this inner region is, but it basically is a reachable set that you can attain via actual optimization. Right? Basically, if I start at my initial point and do gradient descent on this, where am I going to end up? It'll be in some subset of this overall region here. Because I won't reach everything, I'll reach some subset of it. I could try to actually just optimize it. I could try doing that. Um, be hard. Um, it's, a, it's a mixed integer program. Um, or, and this is the trick I think I'll take in this talk here, I can try to form an outer approximation over this region. So if I can form an outer approximation of this adversarial polytope, of course, I can optimize any point in this outer approximation. And say it's tractable, I can optimize efficiently over this thing. I can now do my robust optimization over this outer approximation, and that will provide me a guarantee over the error that any inner approximation can suffer. All right, and that's what we're going to do uh, in, our, in our method here. Now, one last aside that I want to make before I continue is that this procedure really is about training. Right? So it's saying at training time, what can I do to guarantee I'm not classifying something incorrectly? Of course, the question is, what does this say about test time? It's unclear, right? Um, the basic idea here is the following. So, so we're actually not going to say anything about test time, to be honest. But as is the case for deep models in general, um, when they perform well on the training, they tend to perform well on the test set, too. And the nice thing about this is you actually can verify it at test time, too. So at test time, I can look at the prediction that, the, that my trained network makes, and I can test, is there any example in this region that changes its prediction? Right? And if there's not, then I know I'm not an adversarial example, because of course an adversarial example would have to really lie on this other side and then be perturbed to be on this side. So I can develop a zero false negative detector of adversarial uh, examples. Right, at, at test time as well. And so that's going to be the extent to which I sort of talk about test time, training time. This is not really about generalization. This is much more about just optimization performance. OK, so let me talk now about how we go about creating that outer approximation. All right, so this is going to be our method now. Now, of course, I'm just going to re rehash what I said before. If I can form some outer approximation, over my actual adversarial polytope, say this, this is the decision boundary there, I maximize the, or, or I compute the worst case example in that outer set. And if that does not cross the boundary, I know I'm not an adversarial example, or I know I can, you know, no adversarial perturbation can actually cause me to classify that incorrectly. So the question, of course, is well, how do I compute and optimize over this bound? So the starting point here is going to be an optimization formulation of this uh, task of creating a robust, uh, or sorry, an adversarial example. So I'm going to write the problem of optimizing over this, for now the exact region here, as an optimization problem. So I'm going to write it as minimize over z. z is the, all the hidden layers in my network. Um, zk would be the last layer, and I'm trying to, in this case, I guess the real class would be class 1, so I'm trying to or no, be, be, be class two. So I'm trying to basically go in as much this direction as I can. So what's the worst case example that maximizes the wrong class while minimizing the, 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 the logit of, my right, of the right class, subject to the fact that the first layer input has to be within uh, epsilon of x, say in the L infinity norm, though we can do other norms as well, and the fact that the hidden units have to evolve according to a ReLU operator. So each hidden unit is equal to the max of zero and a linear function of the previous layer. So this is the exact formulation of finding an adversarial example for this network. We are going to focus, I should add, on ReLU networks here. Um, you can extend it, but it's actually a little tricky. So we'll focus on ReLU networks for now. All right. So there's going to be three ideas to constructing adversarial, or this, this provable adversarial defense. And the first one is actually the, the, the sort of the, the biggest one, and it's also the easiest one. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace the ReLU constraints, which were non-convex, with, with their convex relaxation. That, that's really all it is. So suppose for a, min a minute I have a bounded ReLU, so I know that a certain hidden unit will never go below Z, or certain, sorry, never go below L, and never go above U. I'll talk about in a second how I get those upper and lower bounds. But if I knew that, I could relax my ReLU constraint to be saying that instead of lying on this, this line here, I now have to lie somewhere in the set. 
So I can kind of cheat, right? I can have a post activation that is you know, positive, even if my normal ReLU was set that to be zero. So I can basically have my pre and post activations lie within this relaxed set now. I can kind of cheat from what my normal network says. But of course, if this doesn't find any adversarial example in this relaxed set, we can't find an adversarial example in the real set. So this actually is, in fact, our outer relaxation here. And now importantly, I can now phrase the problem of finding an of the worst case adversarial example in this convex relaxation as a linear program. Because I'm replacing this, this ReLU constraint that I had before with the fact that the pre and post activations just have to lie within this convex set. So this is actually my outer approximation to the, to, to, to the uh, adversarial polytope. OK, so that's all well and good, but there's two problems here. First of all, we're trying to solve an LP, which is this, has the number of variables equal to the number of hidden units in a network. For every example, for every gradient step we make, uh, every uh, you know when we're training, it's probably not really gonna gonna be feasible. Uh, and secondly, how do we find these upper and lower bounds in the first place? Uh, so I've said we assume we have them, but how on earth do we actually get those? Okay, so th those are gonna be the, the the next two ideas. So the first idea is that we're not gonna actually solve these LPs in practice. What we're gonna do is we're gonna bound them via their dual, all right? Um, so I'm, again, assuming everyone sort of is familiar with basically LP duality here. You can write another uh, LP that is, gives you a guaranteed bound on the objective value of any linear program. Um, but the key insight, so this sort of gives you an outer bound on the outer bound, if you do all the sort of the bounds in the correct way. Um, but what's really cool here, and this is sort of, I was really excited when we found this. The key insight here is that after some manipulation of this, um, you can actually write the dual LP in the form of another deep network, which I'll mention again on the next slide. But that's really the, the sort of the very surprising and very interesting part. You basically write the LP, you, you write the autonomic conditions for the for the primal. Um, you look at the form of the dual, and the dual the, the solution actually obeys some other uh, deep network, which actually looks just like the backpropagation network to the original linear pro, so to, to, to the original um, network. So if the original network sort of was going forward, the dual LP actually looks a lot like the backward pass, which is actually not that surprising because you can derive backpropagation from duality. But it was surprising that it worked when to, uh, to me when you had this extra degree of freedom uh, involving basically violating the ReLU constraint a little bit. So. To be clear, we don't actually solve the dual problem. What we're doing is we're finding a single feasible solution of the, of the dual problem, which ends up being quite easy to do by the, by the form of the dual. It's just a single backward pass to the network. Uh, and this actually lets us compute a feasible solution to the dual, which again gives us, gives us a provable uh, upper or lower bound on the actual LP solution. So um, since I have the whole hour here, I'm going to go a few slides on just what that dual actually is. Um, if this goes a little bit too much detail, don't worry about the next few slides, but yeah, question. Are, are you going to be explaining what, what do you mean by the dual problem can be represented by a function? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain that in the next slides uh, with actually giving the form of it. But if the next part is a little bit too much, don't worry about it either. We won't, we'll sort of pop back up after this next slide. OK, so here's our original problem. Here's our primal problem. It turns out, if you derive it, the dual problem is the following. This, 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 this is the dual of that problem. Now, the terms here are not too important. Um, the important parts are the following. So first of all, a little notation. This little J set here is the set of all activations in layer I that can cross zero. So one interesting thing about our relaxation is that if L and U were both positive, we actually would be have an exact relaxation, right? Because they'd both always be in the linear region. If they're both negative, that's also exact. There's no looseness in our, in our uh, approximation. So our looseness in our approximations is going to depend on precisely on those activations that can cross zero, that basically have that, uh, that, have that uh, re relaxation set be a strict, you know, not exactly the ReLU. Um, OK, so let's look at the terms now in this, in, this ne in, in, in this problem. So this is some objective. I'll get to the terms of the objective in a second. But I want to emphasize first. Um, this part here. So this part here is actually exactly uh, the dual pass through the network. So new k here is just the dual, 
basically the, the backward pass variables. It starts off being negative c. c is the linear vector you're minimizing in the primal. So you start that, you're off of your dual network with that value. You pass it, the um, uh, sort of pre-activations of the dual just become the transpose of w, which is, that should be wi actually, but wi transpose that. Um, and then the pre and post activation of the dual are related by essentially the derivative of the ReLU, which is exactly what you get in a, in a dual network, um, with some modification on this set that can cross zero or not. But the details there are in the paper, so I won't go into more detail than that. But this is sort of what the, this, these constraints here basically are the form of a dual network. Now, the objective terms, um, right, so this is basically essentially the backprop network. Now the objective terms, when you use this kind of notation here, it turns out this term here is exactly just the objective at zero perturbation. So you can't avoid this term at all. Um, you have to, that's just your objective when you evaluate it on the example. Um, this next term is exactly equivalent to the same robustness penalty we see in the linear case. So this is a dual norm of this term here, and this term here would be the parameters if you had a linear model. So you're gonna pay this quantity here as well, always. And this last one here is precisely an extra penalty you pay when you violate the value constraint on this set here. So basically this part is just the same as the linear model, and this part here is a penalty you pay for looseness in the approximation. Can you explain what the index set of j is? Yeah, so the index set j here is, ex let, me, let me actually go back one slide. Um, so here, if I'm always on this side, so if, if L and U were both on this side, I'd have a linear region, I'd be fine. My approximation, my relaxation would be exact. If I'm negative on both sides, it'd be exact. J is a set of activations where the upper and lower, band, uh, lower bounds span zero, so I actually have some looseness in my approximation here, or my relaxation. That's, what the, that, that's sort of the, the, the notion of that, of that J set. And of course, if you're never in it, then this, it's exact, the approximation. That would be kind of boring. It means you're in a linear region of the classifier, so you, you know, it's not a particularly interesting case, but that would be the case. Okay, so that's the, that's the second idea, is that we don't actually ever solve the LP. We just do a single backward pass to the network and get a dual feasible solution that actually gives us a still a provable bound by the nature of duality. Now the last and sort of final idea is, of course, how do we compute those upper and lower bounds? Um, it turns out, though, of course, this is actually the very similar problem to computing uh, a worst case perturbation. Um, specifically, if I want to find out what's the worst, what's how low or how high can, see, you know, for some intermediate layer I prime, can the jth unit become? I just try to perturb that last I guess that should be actually zj there. Uh, basically, sorry, zi prime. Um, you basically try to perturb uh, this quantity, you know, how low or high can that particular activation go in the same form of an LP as before, with all my relaxations before. So what I can do here is basically build up my, uh, my activations or my upper and lower bounds layer by layer, where first I use, you know, the initial constraints to generate the upper and lower bounds for all the units of my first layer. <clears throat> then all the units my second layer, all the units my third layer, et cetera. Um, there are some details here. I can't use a particular uh, value for the du some dual from some free variables uh, from the dual called alpha. And we pick a certain value of these, and I think there's still some. Uh, we're still trying to figure out exactly what that what that variable implies, because that actually lets us compute all of these simultaneously. Um, and you can do it quite a bit faster than you could if you have to solve that problem from scratch each time. But basically that's the idea, is we build them all incrementally because we can solve that problem using only variables in previous layers. And we can build it incrementally like that. Okay, yeah. EJ, sorry, EJ is the, base, the unit basis. Of with, so it has a one in the coordinate J and zeros all the way else. So yeah, th thank you for that, yeah. So you're basically trying just to, to, to make that one unit as small as possible or as big as possible. That actually is exactly what the lower and upper bounds are. <clears throat> yeah, so, so J is every, goes over every, uh, every hidden unit in the I prime layer. So if I want to compute the lower bound for I prime, for the layer I prime uh, with, at unit J, I solve this LP. This should actually be uh, Z I prime there, is the one typo. Yeah. So solving this LP over here, isn't it 
the, it has the same computational complexity of the original optimization problem that we are trying to solve? Well, I mean, you would solve it also with the dual approach, of course, right? <laughs> um, but you actually can be a little faster than that even. You can actually solve, solve them all simultaneously. But it is still the most expensive part of this process. So I'll talk in a second about how we make this a little bit faster. The other thing I don't understand is, uh, so you're solving, sorry, just go yep. back one. So the constraints have li and ui. So yes. You're solving for, aren't you solving? For all of these up until the i prime layer. So you only need the layers before see, this so to compute the last layer. Yeah, so you always just sort of do this incrementally one at a time. Yeah. All right, so putting it all together, the final robust optimization story is the following. All I'm doing at the very end is that instead of minimizing traditional loss, so my loss of my network on the examples drawn from the data set, I'm minimizing some other function of my examples, some function I'm calling j there, which is the upper bound on the possible robust loss I can suffer. And so this whole quantity here, Actually, I should say J is sort of a, a worst case perturbation of the example. And so this quantity here is a strict upper bound on the loss that the classifier could suffer under any adversarial perturbation. Right? And th now, granted, the bound's pretty complex, right? We have to solve incrementally every upper and lower bound, then do a backward pass and with, with a certain vector at the end. It's kind of complex. But the beauty about sort of modern, and really, I'm still amazed by these things, right? Modern uh, deep learning frameworks like PyTorch is you can code all of this procedure up in an auto-differentiating framework like PyTorch, and then just take gradients. And all of a sudden, I can optimize this whole thing with this gradient descent. Uh, and so instead of minimizing my normal loss, I'm minimizing a strict upper bound on the worst case loss I can suffer under any adversarial perturbation. Um, and again, at test time, I can evaluate it to see if there's possibly adversarial or, adversarial or not. OK, so let me go through quickly a few things here, because um, I do want to get to the experiments before, before we finish. So the first question I think is, is, is uh, worth answering is, OK, so just tell me how long it all takes to compute. How hard is this really? Um, now, the, the, the answer is, is it's quadratic in the number of hidden units, the short answer is in the worst case, it's quadratic in the number of hidden units, which is still too slow. We can't actually do, you know, solve something with where we're talking about the number of hidden units squared in the network, so we'll talk about how to fix that later. Uh, question. Uh, for the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, so you're saying that you can just code up, uh, you know, in this fighter or whatever, yep. and like take grains of it. So this is true uh, only if you have a closed form or uh, or if you do a single grain step of your optimization problems that you present. Uh, uh, so no, what you do is you code up this sort of dual analytic form of the solution of the dual, uh, and then you just that's all analytic though. Um, it, it, it is iterative; you have to compute it iteratively, but it ends up being all an analytic function. So for example, for, for computing the upper and lower bound, you yeah. have to solve uh, the problem. So again, we use the dual, the same sort of single dual pass to compute those upper and lower bounds. So it's iterative; you have to solve many steps. Um, but it is just, it's not, it's, it's, it's sorry, it's, it's sequential, but it's not an iterative procedure. It's not like it goes on forever. It just, everything is just a single computation to compute upper and lower bounds using this dual form. You never solve the LP, you just compute a dual solution for all of these things. So you're basically just saying that you're doing gradient descent and dual, and that's what that neural network is doing for you? Uh, no. So the dual gives us our upper, our guaranteed robust bound. And then we use gradient descent, and, and so with no gradient descent there. We're not solving the dual with gradient descent, we're not doing any of that. We just get a bound, a feasible, a dual feasible solution with this sort of analytic form here. And then the gradient descent part is on the, we code all that bound up in PyTorch, so we can differentiate that bound with respect to the underlying network parameters, and then we minimize that upper bound with respect to the network parameters, not the dual function. The bound itself is just closed form, essentially. OK. This one, it's too slow for large networks. We'll fix it in a second. Next question is how tight's the bound. This is actually, I think, a really important question. So the answer is, if I take a network kind of off the shelf, that bound's very loose. Basically. Um, your upper and lower bounds you can achieve are very, very big, meaning your looseness grows at every layer of the network. Meaning with a few, after a few layers, it's essentially 
you know, as big as anything. So what's interesting is you, in order to actually make this bound work, you have to train a network to minimize this bound. It will not work on, an off the, on, on sort of a standardly trained network, even, or even an adversarially trained network uh, with normal adversarial training. You have to train it to minimize the bound. But when you do that, then the bound's pretty tight. <coughs> All right, let me say, in, before I get to the experiments then, let me say in five minutes now how we actually go about scaling this. So uh, I'm, I'm going to gloss over this pretty quickly here. Um, this is actually work from our, our, our follow paper we have coming out of NIPS this year. Um, but basically, that bound, while great, still was quadratic in the number of hidden units. Um, and it only applied to sort of pure feedforward networks. Uh, and so we wanted to sort of extend this to a little bit more rich structure like ResNets at least um, and have it be faster than it is right now. So there are two main ideas of this uh, recent work. Um, the basic, the first one is that the bottleneck of our bound computation comes in basically in passing through an identity matrix through the whole network and then computing row-wise L1 norms uh, from that. This involves, this basically comes from the dual term that involved that L1 norm. The way you compute it in practice is you basically pass, for, pass through an identity matrix through the network, and then you get row, you, you get sort of uh, row-wise L1 norms to compute basically all the upper and lower bounds uh, for each hidden unit there. Uh, again, details here are not important. That, 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 that's the computation it involves. So um, what we do is we use a technique from random projections, namely nonlinear random projections, to compute an unbiased estimate of the row-wise L1 norm. Uh, via basically a median or a geometric mean estimator. So the idea here is that actually you can feed a, instead of the identity, you can feed a random Cauchy matrix into the network, and then instead of computing row-wise L1 norms, you compute row-wise medians or geometric means. Uh, and that gives you an unbiased estimate of the L1 norm of these row vectors, and you can use that to compute either a probabilistic bound or just an approximation, an unbiased estimate of the actual bound, and we use that at least at training time. So for testing, you have to actually compute you know, a real bound. Um, but at training time, which is the, the big bottleneck, you can use these estimates to, to speed up training substantially. Um, second one is that to handle more general network structure, we talked about only feed forward networks before. It turns out the same exact thing applies to general networks. If you use a ResNet, then your dual network is just the form of a ResNet, um, and everything kind of works the same way. So if you have a ResNet, the thing you basically your dual network is now a ResNet, and everything works as it did before. All right, so let's let's now sort of conclude with how this actually works. Um, so first, I want to want to show you a quick just a quick visualization of sort of what this looks like in in two D. Um, here's a simple toy problem with a you know, four layer fully connected multi fully connected MLP uh, train. Doesn't really matter what the what the training procedure is here. But if I take, so there, there's a bunch of red dots and blue dots here, and I'm showing an, you know, an epsilon ball around each of these. If I train these sort of in a standard way, I will, of course, get points here where there's some decision boundary within this ball. The, the original algorithm knows nothing about those balls, and so, of course, these things, these points here are you know, adversarial examples for this network, right? They are a point where that's classified as blue, but there's a corner that's classified as a different color. When I train it, though, by minimizing our upper bound, as I do over here on the right, um, you know, we're able to actually guarantee, on the training set at least, that there are no, uh, no possible adversarial examples in this, in this data set <laughs> after fitting. Which is very cool. I mean, this is sort of you know, one of the first times you could actually guarantee, make a guarantee like this about the output of a deep network. Uh, while still clearly being nonlinear, uh, was able to prove that you can't actually fool it by a perturbation, at least not inside that norm ball. Um, OK, now I'm going to move on a little bit from that. So this is, again, just to preface things here, we are talking about CIFAR and MNIST as our data set still. We're not going big by any means. We're talking about small models and small data sets here. But in these small models and data sets, we actually get some, some, some compelling results. So I want to talk now about a um, MNIST and we're going to apply a strided conf net to MNIST. Now, one thing I didn't really emphasize before, but um, because our procedure for computing bounds involves just a backward pass, we can do convolution. We can handle convolutions just as well as we can handle linear, linear layers, right? It's just a, we just need to compute the transpose of the convolution, which is just already implemented in all these frameworks. So we can handle convolutions just as well as we can handle normal, uh, normal fully connected layers. Um, OK, so I want to show a few different plots here. So I'm going to show basically standard errors and standard and robust test errors on MNIST. 
So if I train a normal network on MNIST, um, I get about, and this is actually a really small network, relatively speaking, I get about you know, a 1% error on MNIST. Uh, this is digit classification, right? Um, but if I'm allowed to compute my you know, worst case, I basically get 100%. This is actually our bounds, not just the actual attainable error, but the attainable error is pretty much the same. You can basically fool MNIST pretty much all the time, uh, even though its nominal error is very low. If I run that robust linear classifier I talked about at the beginning, um, the nominal performance is, is better. Uh, well, sorry, it's, it's much, much worse nominal performance. It's 17%, but the robust performance is quite a bit better. That bound actually shows that there's no example on the test set now, importantly, that can make this uh, worse than 44%. And that's just that, that linear bound I showed at the very beginning, that analytic form of the maximization. Um, there was some s s concurrent work um, out, of, out of Stanford uh, using a SDP approach by Aditi Raghunathan and, and others um, using an SDP approach. And what they were able to show is they can get a network with 5% error, uh, nominal error, and a, a bound of no more than 35%. Um, whereas our method, when we do all of this, it gets about 1.8% error, and our robust bound says no, no attack could achieve more than 5.8% error. And actually, since then, we've been able to strengthen that a little bit more just by building a bigger network. Now we can get basically the same as what the, not quite the same as this still, but you know, on the same order of this, uh, and get our, get our robust error to about 3.7%, which is about as, I think, as, as, as you know, on par with even follow-up work uh, on our own. So this is sort of where we currently stand on MNIST. Um, now, a, a reasonable question here is, so how well can actual attacks do? So if you look at an actual attack, uh, and I'll show this on bigger models in a second, because it's much, it's actually quite a bit different on bigger models. Um, if I take standard training, right, my, my uh, nominal error is that, my robust balance is 100%, but if I actually try PGD on that objective, I get pretty close to it. I think we could probably actually even get it higher if I really care to try much more. Um, basically, this is, this is pretty good. Um, of course, you know, we have a small band to play with, but basically, um, it seems like PGD gets pretty close to the actual bound here. So our, our, our sort of room for improvement and our bound is pretty small here. And our, our, our gap we're paying from our, our looseness here is from about 5.8% to um, at least 4.1%. And so, you know, wherever the true error is, is, is unclear. We actually, uh, some folks at MIT actually did go ahead and compute it actually. I think it's like 4.37, uh, the actual error, using an MLP. Um, MIP, sorry. <laughs> I mean, neural network land. Um, it was a question there, though. Yeah. Sorry, could you remind what PGD is? PGD is projected gradient descent. So just solving that uh, maximization of a loss heuristically. I would, not heuristically, but, you know, as well as we know how to solve it in practice. And I'll get to some... Uh, more modern numbers in a second um, on, on larger data sets. Because I think actually that's, there's going to be a much bigger gap on other data sets. Yeah, what do we? For large epsilon? Uh, for large epsilon, which I'll tell you in a second, that's where the gap is. It's much worse. Um, so for, for large epsilon, for 0 0.3, it's four, uh, 47, 40 something percent, which I'll show in a few slides. OK, now, um, timing results on larger models. Before I get to how bad the results are, or how much room there is for improvement of larger results, um, let me talk just first about how well we can scale with this new method. So basically, before, scaling didn't work. Because if you have an, an, the exact solution and anything close to a large number of hidden units, you run out of memory really fast. Uh, so you can't even do it. And then you run out of computation a little bit slower, but still really fast. Because we're talking still about quadratic and the number of hidden units. And so pretty quickly, you fill up your, your, your GPU, and you can't solve things anymore. Um, but with our, with our, and that's the blue line here, basically, it runs out of memory very quickly and then runs out of computation a little slower, but still pretty quickly. Um, whereas if you use our random projection method, you're able to basically scale, again, linearly with the size of the hidden, of the, of, of the, of the uh, number of hidden units. So again, our training procedure now, like normal training, scales linearly in the number of hidden units in the network. It's a reasonably big multiple, it's about 50 times worse than normal training, which is not ideal, but you know, uh, if, if we were more than an academic lab, we could probably do a lot with, with, with uh, just 50 times worse than normal training. OK. Let's talk now about performance on the larger data sets here. So uh, now to answer your question, um, if you run M MNIST on a larger epsilon, uh, so this is with a, even a small model and it's working best here, you get 43% error, whereas the standard error of that model is 12.6%. Uh, if you do CIFAR, you get, with, with, with this, with relatively small epsilon, you get 46% error and a standard error of 31%. And ResNet, you get, you get uh, 
or, uh, with, with, with two resident models, you get this amount, and with a larger epsilon, you get worse performance. Yeah, what was the question? Uh, so this is, I mean, these, these are these are throws from your paper, actually. <laughs> um, so uh, this one I think I actually estimated from your from one of Alex's charts because he didn't actually have this number, but I, I just sort of traced the line and got that. Actually, no, he must have given this to me because I wouldn't have put a decimal point otherwise. So who knows? Um, he has it somewhere. So so this, this is sort of where where so this gap actually is not bad. So if I run PGD on these models, you get something pretty close to this. That's not the real question. The real question is like, can I just build a better model? Period. And the answer empirically is yes. So empirically, and this is where the, I think the gap still exists in these, in these methods. Um, if I run PGD to train my models with adversarial training, I can build a model where we cannot break it more than, say, 10% with epsilon of 0 0.3. Whereas our model that we, you know, is guaranteed, but still, um, you know, guaranteed, but still uh, slower and all this kind of stuff is, is uh, to train at least. Um, only gets a bound of 43%. And in fact, even the actual error is higher than this one. So this is definitely a worse model in some sense um, than that one. And so I think this is where the gap still is, which I'll talk about more in a second in terms of comes to future work. But clearly, um, while this is sort of encouraging, because it really is one of the first times, I mean, there's been subsequent work as well, but it's really the first time that we've been able to say provably that no attack strategy, no matter how complex, can have higher error than this, this is again on the test set, so this is on test set examples. Um, Wait, sorry, what does that mean? Oh, it means that basically I'm computing an upper bound on the possible test error. So when I'm evaluating the test set, I can. We care about the test error. What do you mean by we care about the test error? We care about new digits. Uh, the te uh, sorry, new digits. So when you say test error, do I have to look at the 10,000 examples? Yes. Well, so I'm I'm computing post hoc the worst case test error I could have under any adversarial perturbation. On this fixed test set. On this fixed test set, yeah. This is still MNIST and CIFAR, right? This is still what we're talking about here. We're still in the land of small data sets. Um, and you couldn't, I mean, this is actually quite hard to do, though, to say anything provably about deep networks. And this is something we can say. Provably, these networks have this performance level. Um, the training, you can say the same thing about the training set, of course, too. But this is, this is saying, on the test set, you have this, 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 this performance. I mean, you know, so this is a test error under any adversarial perturbation. I understand, but I'm just saying that the, the, when you're saying we're proving something. OK, we are proving something about the performance of the network under arbitrary norm bounded in perturbations. No, I understand. <laughs> OK. Um, yes, under arbitrary norm bounded perturbations, we can say this on, the, on, 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 these, on these data sets. Um, but there's still a big gap between sort of our best empirical methods and these provable methods. Yeah. Sorry, how, how are the empirical robust error values being calculated? Yeah, so basically we just run PGD. This is sort of the PGD. Uh, run on the trained networks that are trained with adversarial training. So you try to find sort of the empirically worst case one you can. If you compute the bounds, by the way, on these, they're really high. But we can't seem to actually find better. We can't actually break them. So we sort of don't know what these really are. Um, though evidence suggests that they're actually pretty robust. OK, so um, a lot's happened since this paper came out. We posted this paper now uh, almost a year ago. And a lot's happened since then. Um, so there has been a lot of concurrent work, including uh, work I have not sorted through yet. So there's been actually also 82 submissions to iClear on adversarial examples kind of uh, as a whole. Um, one of my students is starting to go through all of those and giving me reports uh, hourly about the different things. But um, so PhD students do, right? Um, there are two uh, big concurrent lines of work, though, that I do want to, to uh, highlight. So I mentioned this work um, by Aditi and others, um, which is really concurrent work. And the difference there is that we're using an SDP instead of an LP to bound these things. And you can actually get tighter bounds sometimes. Uh, but it also does seem, I mean, not always. So the training procedure was worse. But that really was because, I should emphasize, they trained a much simpler network because they had a hard time scaling these things. So that bound I showed was the biggest network they trained, which, which was not the convolutional network. And they're still trying to figure out how you can, if you can, scale those networks. Um, there's some work at DeepMind that, that, that builds upon ours, um, which basically and, and there's, there's a lot of differences, but sort of one of the differences, what, what the way to summarize this, is that they use a very similar approach, but they just, instead of finding a single solution to the dual, they actually optimize the dual variables after the whole training procedure to compute their bounds. So they actually further optimize the dual solution after you've done it, and that gives you a better bound. Um, and then there's work out of ETH Zurich, 
which is actually, I think, qualitatively different. So they're, they're using a similar technique, but they're using a, a zonotope representation of the uncertainty set that they propagate kind of forward to the network instead of backward. Um, and I think these seem complementary. They get slightly worse results right now on CIFAR, but they seem complementary. And so I think that there's a lot of interesting work to be done merging these two things. <coughs> and as I said, I can't even become close to yet to summarizing kind of current work. And we'll see whether that same thing will happen with iClear about all the, all the examples that are, that are, all the papers that are accepted being subsequently broken um, within the review period. OK, so I want to just finish up now um, and, and, and conclude with a few last thoughts. So the first one is that I think this sort of line of work here um, is, is presenting a really interesting new way of looking at adversarial robustness in deep networks. Right? So we can, for the first time, really prove something, I think, formally about the adversarial robustness of deep networks. But we still need new advances to scale these things to really large domains. So I don't think we're up to ImageNet scale yet. And I think it's not just a matter of bigger compute. Um, I think our models are, when we apply these bounds to really big models, they tend to over-regularize and basically end up with really simple models that get really bad performance. So we do need ways of tightening the bounds, um, both in terms of their sort of, you know, making them more computationally efficient, but also uh, understanding the representation better. Uh, actually, this is more the second point. But we need to speed up the things, both from a computational standpoint, and we need to sort of figure out what are better representations for representing these, these, um, these deep networks. Um, there's still this gap, this big gap, between the best practical models we know how to compute and the models we can prove things about. And we need to close that gap. We need to understand, you know, can we prove anything about the more empirically well-performing models uh, formally, or alternatively, can we find the tighter approximations that let us train provably better networks? Um, and the last one I'll actually say is the kind of the real downside here, which is who cares about L infinity perturbations? It's a silly example. It is visually, I mean, I would sort of argue it is a necessary condition because these two images with a small L infinity perturbation, they are indistinguishable to humans. If we can't even do that, it's very hard to argue our models are anything close to human level. But what we really want, of course, is some notion of robustness that captures uh, kind of what a person would say, right? So what would a person say is the same image as another one, which of course is not a convex set, and very, very hard to specify. And things like translations, rotations, clearly violate the L infinity bounds, yet are things we believe we should be able to handle. So these are examples where we clearly think we have instances where we should be EB robust, but we can't yet quantify it. And so I think actually the most promising direction for a lot of work is to figure out what do we even mean by attacks? And what should we even be robust to? And then once we define that, and it's going to be non-convex, how do we think about actually providing any guarantees about robustness to these perturbations? Um, lastly, I'll just say that you know, if in, in, in this crazy event that you don't want to implement that entire upper and lower bound computation, uh, we do have nice PyTorch torch code for this. You can just take your model, make a call if, if it has only ReLUs and, and, and ResNet layers in it, and no batch norm. Um, but that's a good thing anyway. We don't like batch norm here, right? <laughs> uh, you could actually just plug it into a PyTorch layer and can compute your upper bound on your loss and minimize that if you have a lot of time instead of your normal thing. Um, so all this code is available. And I, in the few minutes I have left, I'm happy to take any questions now. Thanks. <laughs> I guess if I have time left. I don't know what the etiquette is about the 10 minutes and uh, if talk's supposed to end then or if it's supposed to end on the hour. No one does. All right. All right, good. <laughs> so I think we have, some, we have time for some quick questions. Yeah, so that's a, great that's a great question. So the question was, and I'll repeat them because we don't have the mic here. So the question was, can you preach in a model with standard loss and then fine tune it with adversarial loss? The answer is that does not work at all. Um, when you train a network with standard loss, um, your adversarial loss blows up, or your upper bound that we compute blows up. It becomes huge. Basically because there's no regularizer on the terms, and that means that it's going to be huge, your robust loss. So, so when you do that, your robust loss, actually, when you train the network standardly, your robust loss actually becomes much, much higher than uh, the loss of a random classifier. So 
as far as I know how to do so far, and maybe you could somehow like you know take that and somehow scale it down to be more robust, I don't know, but from what we found so far, you can't pre-train with normal loss. Normal loss somehow puts you in this valley where you are very far from any robust model, and you need that robustness basically from, from zero in order to get you anywhere. You also actually have to do a little warm up where in practice you actually don't, you start with epsilon, with epsilon schedule, where you start epsilon close to zero, and then increase it gradually, because if you start it too high, there oftentimes you just get stuck at zero and you never move out of your random model. But we've been unable to sort of do any sort of pre-training um, and make things work at all. Yeah, great question. Yeah. I said there were nine defenses that were broken. So I believe there were 12 total published defenses. I just looked in the paper, they have nine with seven out of nine are broken. Like the laundry defense is not broken. Right? OK, yeah, so, so the three that I know about that are not broken, uh, I think they added a few more that were broken. So, OK, anyway, the, the numbers are, are, are immaterial, but I'll, I'll, I'll change it. I, so the ones that are not broken, as far as I know, is, 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 the, is, is, is yours. Um, and then the two certified defenses, so Aditi's and, and, and John Ducci's, even, even though, again, I, I should. I, Forget the first author, so I apologize for that. Um, but uh, those are the three I know that are not broken. The rest, as far as I know, were broken. I thought there were total, so I thought it was nine that were broken. If I'm wrong about that, but by all means, but the point the point stands. <laughs> yeah, there were, I, so I probably should say you know there were twelve that were proposed and nine of them are broken. There's a better way of saying it. Yeah, still not great. <laughs> still bad odds, right? For uh, for a defense me mechanism. Yeah. So for those that were broken, I'm not familiar with this. Uh huh. Yeah, so, okay, so this is a great question. So actually, um, the talk to watch, by the way, is, uh, so the question is, is, is these nine that were broken, how were they broken? Um, so Nicholas Carlini and uh, Anish uh, Athalia, who Nicholas was here until recently, actually, and, and, and Anish uh, Athalia, gave, he, they both gave great talks in this, at ICML this year. Their paper on breaking them was one best paper award at ICML, actually. Um, so what a lot of the methods did that you know were defenses, they worked by essentially obfuscating gradients. So because the gradient of a model tells you how to you know, form an adversarial example, what these methods did was they kind, of, they kind of hid that gradient signal, either by randomization or making the function more jagged or more noisy and things like this. And what they found was basically you could basically replace those noisy versions with smooth versions of those same functions, do gradients in those smooth versions, and then break the model that way. Um, now, some of those defenses did not even test against attacks on their model. They played the other game where the defender goes second, and so if you're giving a fixed attack and you can defend however you want, it's not very hard to break that. What of course matters is, you know, if I, if I know your defense, can I break that? Um, and even the ones that tried that were, were easy to sort of, they were, they were basically playing the game of trying to, trying to, trying to kind of <clears throat> confuse the gradients to make them more noisy than, than they looked like. But if you smooth those, that kind of just works. And so the, they weren't that hard. They basically just smoothed things out a bit, and it just worked. And they ran PGD, and then it just worked. It broke all of them. Yeah. So it also speaks to, I think, this sort of notion that, um, and I think this is changing now. I certainly see this changing, um, but I think this paper drove it home, is that, for a long time, it was sort of seen as somewhat ad hoc. You sort of, see, you know, this defense seems like it prevents these other known attacks from working. Well, let's just let's just throw it out there and see if it works. Um, and that strategy, I think, is 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 very flawed. Um, and so you really need methods that, even when you try to break them, as much as you can, really aren't going to be broken. Which would include this, but it also includes the more practical, better PGD uh, or, or the, the better adversarial training techniques, as far as we know. Any other question? One more yeah. Uh, is there any, are you aware of any work in this area um, looking at the sort of issues of rotation and 3D rendering? Uh, th so the question was, are there any uh, work on the rotation or 3D rendering? So there is work on rotation. That's actually also out of uh, Alex Mondry's lab. Um, I think you were also gone by then, right? Uh, or or we, 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 you're on that paper. OK, so you're also on that one. Um, so you can ask that. <laughs> I was living about this. Um, yes, so uh, not so much 3D rendering, but rotation and translation definitely have been looked at. And they also can break classifiers. Um, standard training ones, those are much easier to be robust to in some ways, because they're a much, uh, you know, much easier threat model in some sense. Um, but they are, they are definitely issues. Um, and and they, they, yes, uh, 3D rendering I haven't seen as much of. But I think if you're operating a thing where you're classifying rendered objects, you're going to be able to do it by similar techniques. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. Okay. So there's another paper again by the. Not, uh, this is just the the guys that built the attack paper at ICML, uh, or the, the yeah breaking all those defenses. They have a, a 3D printed turtle um, that you can that from any angle will appear to be a rifle um, by a certain classifier. Uh, uh, and, and, and so and so that I, I thought okay I have to read the paper. I thought it was simpler than that. It was sort of they were just mapping pixels from. Like, like a flattened version to the version that was there. So it wasn't really rendering, but it was more just like a, a simplified version of rendering. Um, OK. OK, I'll have to look at that again. But yes, but essentially, yes. Uh, people have looked at some more things, yeah. So let's thank Zico again.